Good morning. My privilege, my pleasure to welcome you as we gather together. Uh, I have the misfortune of kind of stopping your conversation, and I have to tell you there's a part of me that is sad about that because it is fun just to hear it and to hear the banner. Um, kind of like when you're on the water, though, some of it carries all the way up. So just want to make sure you're mindful of that. There's some things, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but again, it is, uh, it is a pleasure just to hear that in the spirit in which we are gathering. Uh, if we have not met, my name is Chris Carson. I'm the pastor here at Riverside. And on behalf of just all of the saints and our creator that uh, brings us together, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome us to worship. As we are doing, uh, coming together for worship, I want to remind you that after service, we gather together in the Fellowship Hall just for a time to celebrate being the family, hang out together, eat, eat a little bit, drink a little bit. In a couple of weeks, we are going to eat a lot um, and drink together a lot because we are going to have another potluck after church on the 18th. Um, so sign up for that is in the fellowship hall. The sign up for that is just to make sure we have enough food for everyone. So on the 18th, if you're going to be here, stay for a bit after church. Let's have lunch together. Just enjoy being the family. Let's worship and let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Good morning, everyone. Would y'all please stand and worship with me this morning?
This song's called Reckless Love. We've only done this once or twice together, but uh, I invite y'all to sing if you feel comfortable.
shadow you won't light up. Don't shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb. that together. There's no shadow. No shadow you won't light up. Fountain you won't climb up. Good morning. Uh, please join me in reading the prayer of confession, the Lord's Prayer from the bulletin as you see printed. That will be followed by a few moments of silent confession. We sing praise on Sunday, shouting with joy to you, our rock and our strength. The other days our songs are different, sung to an audience about whom we give little thought. Remind us that our Sabbaths from praising you need not be so great that we can lift up your name in all times and all places that our doing so might just introduce another to you and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray as we've been taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And in Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. Know that we are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, this is a great opportunity to pass the peace to those of us around us and those watching on, um, on computer as well in place, and if the children and fusion youth would like to join us in the front.
Good morning, everybody good? All right, so we've talked a little bit about this before, but I want to make sure um, y'all remember, and it's fresh in your mind. I am holding two books, right? You see that? Anyone doubting me at this point, right? Because we don't look like we're trucking. Two books, right? Um, one is called the Book of Order. One is called the Book of Confessions. You have both of these at home. You read them all the time, right? No, I didn't think so, right? These make up the constitution of our denomination, right? So these are the things that tell us who we are um, in addition to the Bible and why we do what we do. Now, two books, so it's in two parts. The book of confessions is first, it's part one, uh, it says so down here, and then the book of order is part two. So the idea is the book of confessions is what we believe. We confess these things to be true, right? Jesus is God, things of that nature. Um, so this is part one because it shapes why we do what we do. So I'm showing you these uh, because I think it's important just because you have these words and you know what they are. But also, these are the things we use to guide ourselves and to make sure we're on track. Make sense? What are the things that y'all use? How do we make sure we're on track and we're doing the things that we're supposed to be doing? Okay, you pray, right? How else do we stay on track? And it's not just y'all, right? It's everyone. So when y'all are answering, you're speaking for everyone, right? How do we do the things? I, I don't know. If you're like me, you don't think about that very much, right? But I think it's a really important question because we want to make sure that who we are and what we're doing is in line with who we claim to be, right? So things like this help us. Maybe hanging out with friends. If you have friends who kind of keep you on track and say, hey, don't be doing that or don't be doing this. Sometimes it's older brothers or older sisters who say, hey, we're not doing this, we're not doing that, right? My brother and sister, they were younger than I am. They would tell you I did that all the time. And they were not a fan of me at times growing up, right? Um, because sometimes I was harder on them than our parents were, right? But be thinking about those things. What are those things that keep us on track? Sometimes, I know you all don't want to admit it right now, but sometimes it's our parents, right? Um, sometimes it's grandparents, it's those teachers, it's those people who uh, are in our lives kind of as leaders. Be thinking about who they are because it's important that you have those people. When you're struggling, when you're not sure, or it's important that they'll say to you, hey, Trinity, I need you doing this because this is not who you are. Not fun to hear sometimes, but those people are really important people. So be thinking about the ways that you stay on track. What are those resources that help you? And if they're people, let them know you're grateful for them because it's a really cool gift that they provide. Let's pray. <clears throat> Great and loving God, we thank you for this day and this time to come together, to gather in your name and to celebrate you. We thank you for those who shape us in the many ways that they do, and we ask that you would help us all live in such a way that we tell stories about your glory and your honor. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, y'all. If you're able and willing, let's stand together and let's sing.
This morning's New Testament reading is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 14, verses 7 through 14. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down in the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place. So when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all exalt themselves will be hum humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of the Lord.
come to that time when we get to pray for the things happening in the world, within ourselves, within our community. If this is your first time here, you are probably wondering why all of these things up here on the front. They are part of our partnership with Children's Hunger Project. We do a drive twice a year, and, and part of what we are doing is making sure kids in our community who are... Um, food anxious, are able to have food over the weekend, especially when they do not uh, receive food during school when they're home Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, Friday afternoon, Saturday, and Sunday. We'll be collecting food again next week. Next week is the last week, and then the following week on the 11th, we will pack it and begin the process of distributing it to the schools. To put it in perspective, at the end of all of this, there will be more than 5,000 individual items that are collected and placed up here. Uh, Y'all, that, again, just continues to be awesome. And so thank you for your response. It's just an incredible, incredible thing. Another response, uh, last week, you know, we had the concert in the afternoon. The James Taylor experience was here. Many of you were here. It was done in partnership with um, the Village of Hope. Yes, uh, last week on Sunday, more than $12,000 was raised for Village of Hope. It was just an amazing, amazing response. Um, and so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do it every other week. Um, and just And at the end of this time, there will no longer be a need for orphanages in Uganda. Um, Serious talk, though, and I don't know if this is true, it could be a vicious rumor, but by speaking it, maybe we speak it into existence, I think we are going to do another concert, and there is kind of work in the books to make it happen sometime, say, May-ish, uh, coming up. So once that is uh, sure enough on the books, we'll spread word about that. But again, more than $12,000 raised last Sunday afternoon alone in partnership with Village, uh, Village of Hope. So awesome, awesome thing. Thank you again and again for your generosity. Let's pray together. Great and loving God, we come into your place and we thank you for the privilege of being able to gather. To gather in your name, to gather with friends, to gather with family. To gather knowing that brothers and sisters are doing this throughout the world at the same time. And we ask, Lord that collectively our voices would speak praise, would speak honor, would speak glory to you, so all of the world might hear and feel something stirring within their hearts. It is right to start, it is right to end, it is right to be in praise before you, because you are great and do so many incredible things. It would take forever just to begin to list them, 
but know that we feel grace upon grace upon grace. And each time we are baptized in grace, we are able to live into fullness that we can't even begin to imagine. We also know that comes with a call, a call to extend that grace to others, be they in Uganda or just next door. So let us reach out in ways that offer grace to a world in desperate need of it, that offer healing amidst brokenness, that offer joy in the midst of pain, that offer life in the midst of death, so that all people in all places might be able to live fully, as fully as you intend. We gather together as your people and we thank you for songs to sing and stories to hear and smiles to share and people with whom to gather. We thank you for voices that lead us some out in the present and others behind the scenes, and the way all those voices together enable us to be who we are. And so we ask now that your voice might speak to us. We're not picky about how you do, just that you speak, so that we might leave today with a better understanding of who we are and of whose we are. In your name we pray. So I have been summoned to jury duty I figure after a year, that is about the time I get on the list. I know in the grand scheme of things, this really means nothing because I have been summoned before and I have never served. I know this is my civic duty and I should be excited, but I'm not. I don't know anyone with the sense to come in out of the rain that is excited about serving on jury duty. I think if you're excited about it, it should automatically disqualify you from serving on jury duty. But it's not that I just don't want to serve on jury duty. I don't even want to go into a courtroom. Again, I have been in three in my life, and that is more than enough. The first time was my freshman year of college, and I praise God every day that my record now has been expunged. I'm kidding, a little bit. (laughs) No, I am kidding. So the way it worked is this. Someone had the great idea, one of my fraternity brothers, on Halloween to go to night court. We figured you can't imagine who's going to be brought in on Halloween on night court. It's going to be one of the biggest and fun nights of the year just to watch the whole parade of fools go by us. If you think this might be a fun way to spend your Halloween evening, hear me, people. If you get nothing out of this sermon, do not go. In the five years I went to college, and I know most people go in four, but I went in five, it was the most boring night I had in my entire college existence. Miserable. We did not trust that fraternity brother again after that. The other two times I went in support of congregation members. What I remember about each of those three experiences is that I did not enjoy any of them. They were all sobering in in different ways and perhaps that's how it should be. I, I don't think anyone really wants to find themselves in court, to find themselves being judged to find themselves on trial, whether that is true if we are talking about the court of law or just the court of public opinion, being judged is not fun. But that's how we find our ancient brothers and sisters as we read this morning. In a minute, we are going to read from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, and they are on trial, and they are on trial standing before an angry God, and it has got to be a scary thing. Sure enough, it cannot be fun. And it's crazy to think about God this way because what we know about God, standing before God and being on trial, should be a welcome experience. And yet, even still, I don't know that people are excited about that either. I know for a fact our brothers and sisters weren't. Because in the trial scene that we are fixing to read, God is not just judge. God is prosecuting attorney as well, laying out the case and about ready to bring the hammer 
We are in Jeremiah 4, and it goes like this. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, it is spoken as if the prophet is speaking to the people, but in this instant it is a trial scene and the prophet is speaking, but, but the image is that the prophet is actually God speaking God's words. Jeremiah is just speaking on behalf of our creator. Thus says the Lord, what wrong did your ancestors find in me that they went far from me? And they went after worthless things, and they became worthless themselves. Again, we have our brothers and sisters on trial. God is the judge. God is the prosecuting attorney. It cannot be a comfortable place to be. And the question is rhetorical. What wrong, go back for a minute, please. What wrong did your ancestors find in me? It is one of those questions that they're not supposed to answer. Everybody knows the answer. The answer is nothing. Both sides would attest to this. The image is like a parent who is speaking to their children and say, are you kidding? You did this again. Or a boss to an employee. There is a distinct power imbalance. Everyone is feeling it. And it is uncomfortable. What wrong did your ancestors find in me that they went far from me? What wrong did they find in me that they would go after worthless things? Because the question is rhetorical, it does not leave room for discussion. And so they are sitting there and just waiting for the hammer to drop again and again and again. God is mad. And when we are mad, we do and say things that we don't always intend And so let's be clear, because the story of faith of 2,000 years is that we have, at times, beat up on our people, tried to remove passion from the argument for a moment. No one is worthless. No one is worthless. People have been told over and over again that they are. God is mad in this moment. But that doesn't change the fact that our brothers and sisters might be in trouble. They might have made some mistakes. But they were still at creation, pronounced not just good, but very good. And in the moment, passion is taking over. It's important because one of the things that is true of humanity over time is we have struggled with sense of self, sense of worth, sense of... We have been told by people who should not tell us these things that perhaps we are not very good. Hear me. No one is worthless. Each and every one of us, each and every one of us have pronounced, been, been pronounced not just good, but very good. And we have been pronounced so by a voice that cannot be trumped by any other. No one is worthless. But the beautiful thing about faith is that it is a relationship. And we are in relationship with our creator. And what we know over the course of history, regardless of the history, biblical or whatever, is that because that relationship is real, there have been times in that relationship that our creator has been angry. This is one of those times. It does not change the fact of who we are and whose we are. We go on like this. They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt? They did not say, where is the Lord who led us in the wilderness, in the land of deserts and pit, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through? They were not telling the story that we just sang about. Just a minute ago, the story of the Exodus, 
which in the Old Testament is the saving act in the Old Testament. It is like Easter for Christians. Everything in the Old Testament kind of hinges on that moment, and they were no longer telling that story. They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt? who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through, where no one lives. I brought you into a plentiful land, says the Lord. I did so so that you might eat its fruits and its good things. But when you entered, you defiled my land. You made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied to Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, once more I accuse you, says the Lord, and I accuse your children's children. Cross to the coast of uh, Cyprus and look, send to Keter and examine with care. See if there's ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods even though they are no gods? So the argument ends in irony. The chosen people, chosen by God, have chosen things that are not God's. And that is the crust of the argument. That is what they are being accused of. I don't know about you, but I am glad to not be standing in their shoes. It's one of those moments when I'm like, hey, y'all are over here and I'm here. Y'all go ahead and take this on your own head. I don't want any part of that. But what if we were? What if we, you and I, were on trial? Not standing, standing before an angry God, but what if we were on trial? And what if we had to give an account for our ministry, for who we are and the things that we do, how would we fare, you and I? What if we were on trial? It can be uncomfortable to think about these things, especially if you are like me and you are your own worst critic. The last thing you want to be is be on trial. But it's a good way to keep ourselves in check and make sure we are doing the things that we feel called to do and we are the people we feel called and present ourselves to be. Our session is doing this right now. The session, if you don't speak Presbyterian, is the governing body of the church. They're the ones that make decisions. And one of the goals that we set for this year is to audit all of our ministries, to look at each and everything we do to make sure we are not just repeating the things that we've always done, but doing things with intention and they are serving their purpose and the purpose that we feel that God is calling us to do and be here in the Space Coast area. And we are looking at everything. We've looked at things like the concert series. We've looked at the Easter flowers. We've looked at Picket. And we are going through the process of looking at these things and asking serious questions about it. What is the purpose of this? Not what was the purpose of it when it first started. What is the purpose of it? How are we conveying that purpose? Is it meeting that purpose? What are the strengths of this ministry? What are the growing edges of this ministry? And it all kind of wraps up with, okay, now that we've talked about it, what do we do with it? Do we keep it as it is? Do we tweak it? Or do we nuke it? Those are the options. In August, so at our meeting this month, we audited our meetings. Are we doing what we are supposed to be doing? It can be hard to ask these questions. But again, these questions are important because they keep us on track. And what that means is one of our ministries You know, this pet peeve or this pet thing that we've done, it it might just go away, and that's painful. Or we might add this thing, or we might take this thing that we've always done and blow it out and do it, who knows? But by asking these questions, we are doing our best to make sure they live into what they are supposed to be. What about our overall ministry? What would it look like if you and I did this right now? How would we fare? Before we do this, let's set a couple of ground rules. 
First, let's acknowledge this. We're not perfect. We're not perfect. We're not called to be perfect. But we are human, and so we are sure enough not perfect. And so we could always do things better. Second thing, let's acknowledge this. The list that I'm about to offer is not exhaustive. So if one of your ministries that you love the most, one of the groups that you're part of that you love the most is not in the list that I'm offering, hear me, people, please hear me. It's not a sign of anything. It's not that we're fixing to blow it up. It's not that it's not of value. There's only a limited amount of time. And sometimes I talk longer than I should. But in a way to honor those things. So I think the first question as we think about how we are doing and whether we are meeting who we are called to be is just what is a community of faith supposed to be? What is it supposed to look like? What are those characteristics that are supposed to define it? Let's think about two passages in particular from the Bible, one from the old and one from the new, that give a good idea of what it means to be people of faith. The first one comes from the book of the prophet Micah, and it goes like this. What does the Lord require of you? Hopefully you've heard this before. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly before your God? Now, like most mainline churches, we've got the humility part down. We do all these things, but we don't want to talk about them because it feels weird to do so. And then there is this passage in the New Testament where Jesus says, hey, do not talk about what it is that you're doing. Do not beat your chest. The hypocrites do that. But part of who we are as a community of faith as well is the desire to grow. It's inherent in most communities of faith. Church growth people say this, that 86% of people come to church for the very first time because someone has asked them to come. Someone has talked about their church and what it is that they are doing. 86% of people come to church for the very first time because someone has asked them or someone has talked to them about what their church is doing. If we are not in that group and we profess to want to grow, what that means is we are limiting ourselves to the 14% of people who just show up. Of that 14%, some of them are denominationally based. So they move into an area they are looking for, in our case, a Presbyterian church and a Presbyterian church USA. The other ones just randomly showed up, and they were throwing darts at the board and saying, maybe this would be the one. Humility is a good thing, and it is one of the calls of people of faith. Somehow, though, as mainline churches, we've got to figure out how to talk about ourselves in a way that still feels real, does not feel like bragging, and is inviting to those who are not part of a community and searching for a community. James in the New Testament says this, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep one unstained by the world, to care for orphans and widows in their distress in the ancient world, that is wording for the people who could not provide for themselves. Orphans and widows, those people who did not have a place to go, who did not have guarantee of food, who were looking for shelter, who were looking for home, who were looking for the basic necessities of life. They weren't looking for chocolate milk. 
because they didn't know chocolate milk was a possibility at their time. But when we are partnering with Children's Hunger Project, we are taking care of those in our community, in our world, who cannot provide for themselves. We are making sure they have the things that are just basic. Now, I'll grant you again, chocolate milk doesn't feel basic. But milk, sure enough, does, especially for children. Studies tell us that milk is the thing, calcium is the thing that helps their brains grow. It helps their bodies grow. It helps them become stronger. It helps them live into who they are called to be. And even though we never may never see these kids, if the message they get is they don't have to be anxious just for a moment, what a great gift. If they get, there are people who are standing with them and who love them who do not have to, what an even bigger message. Think about what that might do in our world today when there is so much division, so much brokenness, so much distrust. If the underlying message we are teaching the future generations is you can trust. There are people who will stand up. We know why we are doing it because we are called to do so. But if all they get in the moment is there are people who will stand with them and they can be trusted, what a powerful message. What about our book of order? That thing I'm sure we all read so frequently. What does it say about who a church, who a community of faith should be? As it is talking about the notes of a reformed church. And by notes it means here are the basic characteristics. Here is the makeup of a church. If we do nothing else, we need to do these things. The first is this. It proclaims and hears the word of God. It proclaims and hears the word of God. What does that mean? It means this. It means we respond to the promise of God's new creation in Christ. What we are hearing over and over and over again are those same words that Jenny read earlier during the assurance of pardon. In Christ, everything is new. Each and every day, everything is new. We sing this. We preach this. We read this. The goal is to help people understand that every day resurrection is real. And we as a people get to live into this thing called new life and help others do the same. The second thing it means is this. That as we are talking about the word and as we are helping people experience the word, we are inviting people to participate in this new creation. That means they may have different ideas than we do about what that new creation looks like. And together we have to figure out ways to make that happen. But there's something beautiful about that process because what that means is we are doing something together and the community is becoming stronger and more bold. The third thing it means is this. Okay, the second point is this. So we proclaim and we hear the word of God and we administer and we receive the sacraments. And what we talk about in the sacraments, baptism, communion, in our tradition there are two, in other traditions there are seven, but in ours there are true, is that they are open to everyone. The table is open to everyone. And what we want to do is invite people to grace because the more we invite people to grace, the more we help people experience grace. This looks like this. As we are doing this, we are witnessing to Christ's death. We are witnessing to the resurrection. Again, that new life, new creation is possible. Not just when we die, but in the here and now. It means we anticipate a table in which all people are able to gather together and all of us eat. And inherently, what we all know is that there is more than enough to go around. 
Because what most of us know is that our God is a God of abundance. But again, there's a thousand goldfish here, packages, because there are people in our community who do not know abundance and what they know is scarcity. They do not know they have a place at a table where everyone is welcome. It means this. It means we commit to solidarity with the marginalized and the hungry. Hungry for food, sure enough. Hungry for spirituality, hunger for relationship, hunger for that we dream of a day when there is no longer brokenness among us. When we are participating together as a community, we are setting forth a different picture of what can be in a world that needs a different picture and a different story. We proclaim and we hear the word, we administer and receive the sacraments, and we nurture a community of disciples. And what this means is this, we give ourselves in service to God's mission. We've heard from the Old Testament from Micah, we've heard from the New Testament from James, we've even heard from our Constitution, how are we doing? Again, more than 5,000 items that we are donating and offering in partnership with Children's Hunger Project, doing what we can to ensure kids in our community do not have food anxiety. Last week, it wasn't just kids, it was families, because last week we were partnering with Family Promise, which serves those who do not have shelter in our community, and what we were doing at the very least for a week is we were making sure they had shelter, they had food, so they could go about the process of working towards independence again. Family Promise is one of our great ministries. And I think we all participate in this ministry dreaming of the day that it is no longer needed. But today there are people who do not have shelter. And they are trying desperately to find shelter. And we are partnering with them in that process. And it is an awesome thing. And very soon, very soon, we will begin sheltering them here again a couple of times each year as we participate in, in the rotation with Family Promise. We haven't started that yet, but it will probably be beginning in the fall. And so what we will do is we will invite people to come and hang out and, and spend time with these families, hear their stories. But again, let them know that they have people who are standing with them, who love them, who support them, who want the best for them. Every week we have a Narcotics Anonymous group that meets here on church. Because addiction is real in all of its various forms, and addiction keeps us from living as fully as we are called to do. And it keeps our loved ones and our families from doing the same. And so as we stand with those families, what we are doing is presenting a different way of being and telling them there are people who love them and who support them. And again, want them to live as fully as God enables them. Next week, all of this food will disappear. It will go into the Fellowship Hall. But every Sunday, we have a basket out in the Fellowship Hall, and we have a basket in the, I mean, out in the Narthex, and we have one in the Fellowship Hall as well. And every Sunday, people faithfully bring food that we then take to St. Vincent's de, de, de Paul so that our food can bond with the other churches and the other uh, groups that partner with St. Vincent de Paul, we are able to feed not just the children, but the adults and other people who have food anxieties in our community. A couple of months ago, it wasn't food that stood in the front, but back to school supplies. You remember, there were backpacks and there was paper and there were pens and scissors and tissue boxes and all of those things that children at Cape View and Lewis Carroll need to ensure that they can have a fulfilling school year.
All of these things are social justice. All of these things are ways to help people experience grace, experience resurrection, experience this new image of what life can and should be. These are ways that we stand with our brothers and sisters in our community. And it doesn't matter if they know who's standing with them. What's important is they know that people are so that they are not in this by themselves. And so what that does is it creates in them a picture of community, of invitation, of welcome, a foundation. We have just ended a great, great partnership with the lab school. I think we were partnering with the lab school for like 50 years. And what that did is it teached, taught families how to be families together. And so families would come and they would participate with people from Brevard Community College, now Eastern uh, Florida State, and they would do family training together. What that means for us is once the lab school has their own building, which they have their building now and are just waiting to get uh, occupancy, that we have a whole wing that we are going to use to make sure we are affecting change in our community. We are meeting with people now. We're not sure who's gonna come into that building. It could be people who are combating trafficking because that's real here in the Space Coast. It could be people who are trafficking or combating this. We're not sure yet. But know that we are gonna use that wing in ways that stand with others and again, present a different picture of resurrection, a different picture of what life could be. We gather together as the community and we spend time in the word, the preaching you have to do with, I get it. But every day during the week, there are people who are gathering about the word in some form or another. And because we are doing so, $12,000 last week went to a village in Uganda, an orphanage. Because we do so, we find ourselves called to do this thing. Because we do so, we find ourselves called to do that thing. It's because we spend time listening and praying and hearing what God is calling us to do. Part of it means we have to care for ourselves as well. We have this an amazing group that meets every Wednesday and they pray for a list that is double-sided and they pray hard and they pray real. And so if you have ever asked for prayers for yourself or for anyone, know this, you have sure enough been prayed for. But if it wasn't just them the deacons meet every month and they do the same. The Care and Support Commission meets every month and does the same. Because the message that we want to convey over and over and over again is life is real, you don't gotta do it by yourself. And you have people that love you and support you that wanna walk with you through that process. One of the things from the Book of Order was taking community seriously. Every Sunday after church, we gather for fellowship. And if we're honest, we gather for fellowship other places too. In two weeks, three, I guess, we will gather for fellowship and food and dinner. Lunch, if you are from the north. How would we fare if we stood trial, you and I? We could always do better, sure enough, but I think we are doing well. And I am excited about the things that we are doing and the community that we are. I am excited about what is happening and the love and the way your heart breaks over and over and over again for those, many of whom, again, we will never see. 
And as your pastor, I hope you are too. But what I really hope is this, is that we don't become complacent in our excitement. Because as good as we are doing, there is work still to be done. Let's pray. Great loving God, again, for this time and this place, the people with whom we are called to be together, we give you thanks and praise. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with us in our living, in our being, so that what we do and who we are is who you'd have us be. And together with you and all of children of faith everywhere, we partner together in the completion of creation. In your name we pray. Let's stand together and let's sing. As it was my privilege and pleasure to welcome us, it is my privilege and pleasure to send us out. As a people, let us go in peace, let us go in hope, let us go in joy, let us go. Convinced that there is work to be done, and we are the people to do it. And all God's people said.